culture to be normal is deviant. <laughs> and to be deviant is the absolute norm. Hysterical moral panic reporting baptizes transgression. <laughs> It's very much the quest for authenticity that um, makes moral panics relevant to youth culture. Youth culture has often surprised and alarmed older members of society. As youths grow up, they may become less alarming, but they don't always leave their culture behind them. This is the annual ride out to the seaside, organised by the Ace Cafe in London. It's a respectable fixture in the Brighton calendar. But events on this seafront in the 1960s helped to bring the term moral panic into the vocabulary of social science. In fact, I spoke to the organisers of this uh, last year. and I did ask permission because it is a rocker's day out. And he said, you're very welcome. The more scooters, the better. One day, it, let's call it the Mods and Rockers ride out. The first generation of adolescents to be swiftly mobile doesn't have to travel to find trouble. But when they do ride out, the machine they use marks their faith. For the Mods, it's a scooter. In the rain, they cover up their elegant clothing. Their rivals, the Rockers, look the same in any weather. A black uniform for all seasons. A rocker needs a motorbike which can do a ton to a scooter's 50. The difference in power is a matter of masculine pride. The first time the public noticed mods and rockers coming to blows was Easter Bank Holiday in 1964 at Clacton. Events took the media by surprise and the cameras didn't get there until the day after. Chief Constable, how serious was this disturbance at the weekend? Was it in fact a gang fight? Not as far as we know. It was several hundred young people rather at a loose end over the weekend. And what happened as far as the police are concerned? Uh, they came into the town and finding not much else to do, they uh, committed several acts of wanton and purposeless damage so that the police had to turn out in some strength to deal with them. Either of great annoyance and of great damage to Clacton, I think Firstly, the police have been marvellous. They've done everything possible to, to stop this damage and the ill-mannered behaviour on the part of these hoodlums that come here. Were you and your friends mods or rockers? Mods. Well, we're mods, mods when we dressed up, you know. <laughs> you are mods. mods! What caused all this trouble yesterday? Boredom. On whose part? Well, on both. What happened? On the the well, there was lots of things, you know. They started, you know, you know what rockers are like, don't you? Well, I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> well, they, you know, they're motorbikes. They started bashing into the scooters and knocking our motors. Uh -huh. And what else happened? <laughs> so we, st you know, well, we, it was their fault as well as ours. Uh -huh. Where do you reckon the next battle of that kind is going to be? Well, it's hard to say, isn't it? Whitson it'll be, wouldn't it? It'll be Whitson, will it? Mm. Be down Brighton, more or less. At Whitson and in August, the TV cameras and the police were ready. The battles were smaller than at Clacton, but got much wider coverage. Stan Cohen, a young postgraduate student from Johannesburg, was there too. He was researching social reaction to juvenile delinquency and saw that the mods and rockers story made a fascinating case study. I was, I was always playing three roles. I would you know, sometimes walk around during the day dressed in jeans and trying to listen and, and overhear conversations and talk to kids at youth clubs and talk to kids in the street. And uh, then I would change out of my gear and put on a suit and tie and go and interview a magistrate and hear a completely different version. And then I'd go home and or I'd go to the sleep, you know, stay up in a club all night and come up the next morning and buy the mirror or, or the express and see a, another reality. 
But to see those three different realities, the world that it looked like for the kids, the world that it looked like for uh, middle-class magistrates sitting miles away has never been to the beach, and the world that it was like for a Daily Express reporter were different worlds. Not different worlds in the literal sense, but different worlds in the, in the sense of different images of the same world, and that's, that's what sociology is. You have to find some ways of reconciling, of finding the relationships between them. Cohen realized that media coverage was a crucial link between the different worlds he encountered. He saw for himself that the press exaggerated the scale of the disturbances and the amount of damage and violence. He wasn't the only one to come to that conclusion. Well, I think this is partly a case where the press has let us down nationally. I think this has been vastly exaggerated. At the most 200 pounds of damage was done at Clacton. One of the newspapers itself said there had to been an international incident that justified the headlines in the papers during the weekend. This wouldn't have even been reported. Very much exaggerated by the media at the time. They needed stories and they got them. I was here in 65 and the media came up to us and they told us there was a punch-up going on down the road. Would that we be interested in taking part? Um, we were not interested in taking part because we were here for the girls, not for the getting our heads kicked in. The press coverage triggered a reaction out of all proportion to the original incidents. Collect them all up and put them on a boat and send them out of, to Cyprus where our boys are and bring our boys back that's got common sense. Blimey, I think the police should have been a bit harder on them. Bring back the cat! In 1972, Cohen published Folk Devils and Moral Panics and provided the classic formulation of how a moral panic works. A problem is identified, the causes are simplified, and key participants are stigmatised. A press campaign for action is followed by a response from the authorities, which may reframe the problem and start a new round of moral panic. You could say that the media, by their reaction, kept the panic going and therefore, in a sense, amplified it. And the police, by going along with it, added to the drama, and the drama was what attracted the kids there. There would have been no point in going there if it was just like any other uh, Friday afternoon and on, on the beach. It, you know, without the drama, the phenomenon didn't exist. Cohen also identified an unintended byproduct of the moral panic. In focusing attention on the modern rockers, the media helped define the subcultures, publicise them, and nurture the differences between them. The rockers that start it, you know, they, they screw you. Yeah? And you, if you take them, man. you know, look you up and down and think, it's a funny way of dressing you, think you're a puff or something like that. They think you're a poof. Well, that's the way they look at you, as if to say it, you know. So you look at them back and they come over and start trouble. If you don't bother, they keep on at you, so you have to have to bother. By the way, they dress, the makeup and that they have on them, and the eyeshadow, and the old boots and that. Like, sometimes I fancy them myself. When I went to school, some of my mates had motorbikes and some bought scooters. I also had a scooter myself. The first bike I ever had was I was given an old scooter. So it was quite not uncommon for if your bike broke down, one of your other mates, who after all you'd probably known from a kid, would give you a lift down to the shop to buy something on the back of his Vespa. So I know that, you know, there is a terrific image being brought up as though it was a, a complete hate campaign, but if there was some tendencies that we intended to be down the calves and things like that, uh, and the lads with the scooters intended to be more the wimpy bar, that sort of uh, feature. But in actual fact, the actual friction, it would go off, but not to the biggest extent that I think people would like to believe, if you follow what I mean. Wow, thing. Moral panic is definitely something that historicizes youth culture. The media makes things more permanent by reporting it. And if you happen to participate in a youth culture which didn't get media coverage, then it's forgotten. And if you did happen to participate in some way, with, in some aspect of a culture that was covered on the front page of uh, the tabloid press, you know, for months at a time, uh, then, uh, you know, you really participated in a major event. Well, I think the very creation of mods itself was a, a media creation. They seek him here. Anybody around could see the beginnings of youth culture, 
the way in which adolescent culture was absorbing new messages of consumerism, of spectacle. Don't break him so he's got to buy the best Cos he's a dedicated follower of fashion The mods were creatures of the media. They, were, they had no origin except in their social creation. Round the boutiques of London town Cohen provided an understanding of how youth culture and the media were entwined in the love-hate relationship, typified by moral panic. But why moral and why panic? I think the moral is very important because otherwise it gets confused with social, economic, political or whatever problems, uh, which may well also be there. But I think the moral thing is that it pinpoints something as to do with decline in moral fiber, ethical awareness, uh, good sense, uh, good behavior, the rules and regulations that keep us on the straight and narrow path in society. Well, panic in a common sense way, simply because it arises very quickly, it enormously quickly becomes a large concern in society and therefore it's rather dramatic. Mm -hmm.